I'm excited to welcome Jay Bell to the podcast. Jay was born in Kansas and spent a decade growing up in Missouri and Texas. While working in Lawrence, Kansas, he met his future husband, Andreas, who was an exchange student from Germany. After a stint of living in Germany, the couple currently lives in Chicago. He has always loved books and getting lost in fantastic worlds, especially C.S. Lewis, Piers Anthony, Terry Brooks, and others. Jay is the author of the Something Like series, which also now includes a webcomic and a motion picture of Something Like Summer. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's wonderful to be here. So, let's drop what feels like way back to 2011. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> and Something Like Summer came out. Where did the inspiration for that actually come from? Well, when I decided to write it, I was blissfully unaware of gay fiction in general, which is really odd because I've been a bookworm my whole life, like you said, um, but I primarily stuck to fantasy. And I wrote a couple fantasy novels. Um, and I just, I always had this kind of frustration inside of me because when I watched gay movies, uh, I never quite saw my life reflected. Mm -hmm. I see aspects of it, of course, like falling in love with another guy, like the really basic stuff. Uh, but for me personally, someone who came out as a teenager in the 90s and then from there lived a very normal life. Um, I w wasn't very involved with gay culture at all or gay bars because I was too young. Um, Kansas City at the time really didn't have pride parades. And so I just really want to tell a story that reflected what I grew up with, what I knew uh, to be gay life in the hopes that somebody else out there would read it and say, Hey, that's, that's my life. And there was a lot of responses like that to my surprise. So are you Ben? <laughs> <laughs> I get asked that a lot. And no doubt. There's... Cause it's the obvious question, especially when you give the answer you just did. <laughs> well, yeah. There's aspects of my personality and his, um, but he's, he's very much his own, his own person. I can't sing. I wish I could. So maybe that part's wish fulfillment. Um, I didn't have a Tim Wyman uh, growing up because I was just so out that it was a deal breaker for me if someone was closeted. Um, and I think he's, he gets into a little bit less trouble than I did growing up, too, which is a big difference. <laughs> He's a good kid. <laughs> yeah, he really is at heart. And it's it's an interesting book to me because, you know, it starts in high school. I believe it's Tim uh, Ben's senior year of yeah. high school. And then in this one volume, you track all the way in Ben's life to some years after college. Yeah, it's a 12-year journey, 12 years. And that's, you don't get that a lot in many books, because that, usually if you're going 12 years, you spread out into a few volumes. Um, right. What was the intention of, of how far you took his life? Because there were a couple of moments as a gay romance where you could have ended it and called it, there's been happily ever after, and we're done. Right. Well... I think the reason I, I did that, the, the working title of the book was The Many Loves of Benjamin Bentley. And the concept I had when I first started is I imagined uh, the reader traveling with Ben as he dated a bunch of different guys until he finally found the right one. And I also wanted, um, I guess that's a little bit of my story too, I wanted a previous love of his to come back and for him to have to deal with that. Because a the theme that runs through the entire series is that when you love someone, it never truly goes away. And that's something I believe very strongly. Those feelings might be dormant. Um, they might be bundled up in some layers of animosity and resentment. But if you scratch the surface enough, you'll find those feelings are still there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's primarily why I wanted uh, the reader to kind of grow up with Ben. You, but also that same thing, I was trying to write a book that showed what it was like for me to grow up as an, an openly gay teenager in a world that was a lot less friendly to any gay issues. And um, so I, what you go through as a gay person in high school is different than what you go through in college and also when in your working life as an adult and stuff like that. So that's why I kind of made the journey as long as I did. <laughs> I think it's an accurate picture of the times as well from the late, you know, that late 90s into the into the 2000s. 
yeah. and how and things lot- evolved and how things, you know, got better, for lack of a yeah. better phrase. They got a lot better. Like, I, I chose a great time to came out, to, to came out, to come out. Because as soon as I did, it was just a couple years later that Ellen happened and that kind of snowballed into the mostly progressive environment that we're in now. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> back a little bit, but I've got good faith that we'll take two steps forward again. And then after summer, you, you kind of, you spun everything on its head with autumn. Or right. sorry, winter. Yeah, winter came after, yeah, I got the seasonal order wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> just skip the middle part. Yeah, just skip uh, the winter. And you told the story now from Tim's side and gave more of Tim's backstory, you know, kind of right. before and after. Was that yeah. always the, did you always see that when you wrote Summer that you would end up and flip the story like that? Not at all, no. Um, and that came about because when people read Summer, I'd say about half the readers really, really hated Tim. Like they were really down on him. And that took me aback because uh, even though I might not have been willing to date someone who was still in the closet when I was Ben's age, I still understood why someone would remain in the closet and, and why it's a struggle. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to come to Tim's defense and say, okay, look, it's, yeah, he did some jerkish things that are hard to forgive, but he has his reasons. And I think that goes beyond being closeted too. Most people, if given the chance to explain themselves, um, they have reasons for what they did that might not justify it, but at least it makes it understandable. So, yeah, and then when it, when it comes to the whole perspective switching thing, um, I have to give Piers Anthony credit for that because he wrote a fantasy series called The Incarnations of Immortality that I read when I was younger. And the first five books, uh, the devil is the, the, the main nemesis. He's the bad guy that keeps showing up and keeps ruining everyone's fun. And then the sixth book is the devil's story and from his perspective he's the victim and you have complete sympathy for him uh and i just i find that absolutely brilliant so i was very happy to steal that from him (laughs) yeah i have to say but having read the two pretty much back to back um you give me some really ugly cries oh it's it's some really not pleasant moments because like there was one that happened while I was in the car driving and it's like this isn't yeah. this isn't good, but and especially in autumn I mean there are things winter sorry my my season's messed up too there are things in winter that I knew they were coming because I had read summer and they're yeah. over, you know they're they're overlapping and it's, it's still just boom you you put a lot of like real life crisis in these books yeah i I try to explore all aspects of love and and loss is it doesn't even have to be the death of someone just someone leaving your life can be devastating and it can change how how you perceive everything around you so um it's just really important for me going back to that original goal too um a lot of times the media means well and they'll have like the gay best friend character, and they're still doing this. Like Riverdale is a great example. I love that show, but the the best friend is still kind of like the comic relief. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot more to being gay than casual tryst out by a lake, and being kind of like funny and fabulous. Um, and I just I really wanted to show people that being gay has these devastating moments. It has these, these moments that I think anyone can relate to where they're just, they feel broken inside by that same token. It's really important for me to show that there's always hope that past these dark moments, um, given time to heal, you can find your way back to happiness. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it. Thanks. (laughs) Now, and you mentioned, we, we were, as we were talking before we were we we hit the record button that you deliberately didn't brand these as YA either, even though, and I'll say I've, I've only read, I'm in the middle of autumn, truly autumn and Jace's story this time, but at least the three that I've gone through start everybody's in high school, you know, mm-hmm. in that, in that age, but because you bring them on through a, adulthood also, they don't really fit YA, but you have a particular reason you didn't want to call them YA. Right. There's a lot of backlash against that. When I, f- I first started out uh, with marketing, 
you know, I'd have like a rave review on a blog site and then the comments below it would be like, oh, I don't read YA. Just as simple as that. And I suspect part of that is uh, when we become adults, we tend to forget what it was like to be a teenager. We tend to forget that we felt things that are just as complex as what we feel now. Um, we go through situations that are just as challenging. And perhaps that's why people are dismissive of it. Um, in this genre, maybe it's people are looking for a little heat, uh, which I also don't shy away from. No, you know. I try to... I try to make sure the teenagers are of like a legal age, um, at least with each other and in the state um, that they're in. I try to make it so by that state's law, they're of legal age. Uh, but that's also important for me to show the sexual aspect of gay relationships because there are younger people reading these books and they haven't, their exposure to gay sex has been primarily through pornography mm -hmm. online. Um, so I like showing the emotional aspect of sex or how, you know, sex the first time is usually full of mistakes and embarrassing, not bloopers, but you know, it's, yeah. it, it rarely goes smoothly the first time. It's still beautiful and wonderful, but it's kind of, <laughs> kind of confusing. And that's, that's also fun to show because I hope it's comforting to young people or even older people that, you know, might be late bloomers. I mean, there's people in their thirties that have sex for the first time. So. Sure. What what's the what's the audience segment you get most of your feedback from? Is it young people or is it adults who do who read YA or is it split pretty even? It's all over. That amazes me. Um, it's I do hear from a lot of young people that are struggling with coming out, and that's always wonderful when it's of any comfort to them. Uh, I hear from grandmothers who read these books sometimes with their daughters or grandkids. Um, Plenty of women, plenty of, of older gay guys that lived through the 90s and relate to it because of that. And it's more of a nostalgia trip for them. Um, about the only demographic I never hear from is straight guys, which isn't too surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. I did have one that he had like, a, he was in that Big Brothers of America program. Mm -hmm. I guess the little brother assigned to him was gay. So he read uh, something like Summer, uh, so he'd be able to relate more. And I had a dad that did a similar thing when his kid came out. Good for them. Of, That's nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah those, when I get letters like that, I just heap praise on those parents because that we need more people like that in the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think your books are good examples because you're not presenting what often shows up in fiction. Yeah. And not so much now, but of the very depressing side, you know, right. stuff. I yeah. mean, there may be a depressing moment or two, but overall the story is, is a realistic one of happiness. Yeah. I like to think so too. I think they're fairly lighthearted and they have a lot of humor in them. And, um, yeah, with at least one good cry placed somewhere in the book. <laughs> good cries. And sometimes I think you'll get to this in spring. If you keep going, there's, there's cries that are, you cry cause you're happy. And that's my favorite kind. It's oh, I've done that in the, in the book so far too, for sure. Yeah. Glad yeah. to hear it. <laughs> now you mentioned that, you know, you hadn't really decided at the time to do winter even when summer came out. At what um, point did you see that you were just going to keep going? Because I believe it's now there's seven books in this series. Or is the, is the next one always kind of a surprise that it comes up? I think we're, out, we're up to nine, believe it or oh, not. nine. Okay. It's crazy. And then there's two more coming up. Um, when, when, when Winter came out, when I wrote that, of course, it was kind of like, all right, there's, there's three guys in summer, um, three main guys, I'd say. And so, of course, it was kind of like, oh, I could write Autumn, too, and that could be Jace's story. Uh, and I think it was my best friend. I was having a conversation with him, and it was kind of a joke. And then after I went home that night, I was like, well, I could probably do it. <laughs> and then Spring, uh, it, it's a new character. So that was kind of a risk where I introduce a new character, and it doesn't retell as much as the first two books do. Um, and I really thought that was going to be the ending. But of course, because I introduced new characters, I introduced new love interests, and I was interested to see if I could do the same thing as I did with the others, where it's like, okay, let's find out what things are like from the other guy's perspective. And then it just snowballed from there, because I'm I just crazy about this series. Like, I just love these characters so much, and I've just been running with it, and I wasn't sure if anyone would keep running alongside me, but I think we lost some people, but quite a few of... of 
stuck with me, which is wonderful. I really appreciate it. Yeah, especially over you know six years. Yeah. <laughs> And the books just get fatter and fatter too. It's ridiculous. They do. Every time I queue up a new audiobook, I'm like, wow, this is, you know, X yeah. hours bigger than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of audio, what what was it like to hear, you know, in the first one, like Ben, Tim, and Jace all come to life? I was so nervous about that. Um, but. I, I really tried to find a good narrator that would match the kind of the youthful tone of the series. Uh, and Kevin R. Free is the perfect fit because uh, he's he's a professional actor, he's a stage actor, and I think that makes a tremendous difference. Uh, most audiobooks are read by someone with a very clear voice and they're good at enunciating and all that. But Kevin, each character, he manages to find a unique voice. I mean, especially as the series keeps going, that's especially impressive because the cast just grows. Um, and he's really able to inject humor uh, and make me sound more clever than I actually am in many scenes. Uh, likewise, with the emotional scenes, he delivers those in a way that some scenes hit me a lot harder when I listen to him do it. Um, so it's, it's un at this point, unthinkable. I could probably save a lot of money, frankly, if I just chose a different narrator. But he's, he's worth every penny. He's amazing. Well, not only might it be a, a big difference for you, I, I, I could imagine a little, you know, listener backlash, too. Yeah, you and that, rightly so. <laughs> I, I, admit, I, have, I haven't read any of them. I've listened to every one of them so far. Uh -huh. and I don't know that I could go back to try to read now that I know how awesome Kevin is. I can't go back characters. to writing in the same way, because I, I literally ever since he started doing the audiobooks, because I think four or five were already out before I started doing audiobooks. Um, but now when I write, I hear the character voices almost without exception. Mm -hmm. the, the character voices, how he does them, because they're just such a perfect fit. I've heard that from, we had another author on, actually had them on with their voice artist. Yeah. And she was saying that for the recurring characters in her series, she hears the performer in her head. And sometimes yeah. she'll write a certain way because she she knows it'll get said a certain way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse, along the way, right? Yeah. Now, you've also been translated. I think I saw German, Spanish, and French. Yeah. For summer, at least. Yeah. Um, first of all, how did you come to your, your translations? Because you're independently published, and that doesn't always ca happen for an indie published book. Um. I believe in, with, yeah, I, I was approached by publishers when it came to all of them. I tried to do a little advertising myself where I was like, hey, I've got this book that's gaining attention. Are you interested? And the answer, unfortunately, was no. But then uh, one by one, publishers came forward and made the offer. That's awesome. Yeah. Any, are there, do you see any different kind of reactions from the different cultures the book is now released in with, with these additional languages? Yeah, and it's hard to, it's hard to know why because um, I'm not sure if, I can't speak Italian, so I don't know if the Italian version seems to be, it seems to be doing really well. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's because the Italians are just very passionate people who love deeply, and that's very much like the books. Or um, they change the covers sometimes too, like, that's the standard one for summer. Mm -hmm. and, um, actually, that's Kamikaze Boys. Uh, but they, they decide not to go with the traditional cover art with the Italian ones. I think all the other publishers stuck with uh, the covers as we know them in English. And that can have an effect on marketing, too, where people are like, hey, that looks, that looks cool, or they might like it less. Um, it seemed to me like the French, when they first got something like summer, it was pretty a pretty lukewarm reception. <laughs> The, yeah, and again, it's like, are you? Is it because the translation wasn't up to par? Um, these books are very American centric and very nostalgic, mm -hmm. and I imagine that French life isn't too much like American life. So, I mean, that could be another reason for disconnect. Yeah, it's very, very mysterious uh, when it comes to to foreign translations. You're kind of helpless as an author and just have to have blind faith. Um, the one exception would be uh, the German version, which I was able to at least flip through because I'm fairly fluent in German. 
Yeah. Well, did, did you have Andreas look at it too to make sure that it yeah, worked out? Yeah, I right? did because I, it was one of those. I've had bad. I've been published by foreign publishers, and then my first book was published by a traditional publisher, and I've always had terrible luck where it's just a disaster. Um, there's always that scene in movies where an author gets like a big box of books and they open it up and it's a magical weepy moment, you know, and like their family all grab a copy and they'll snuggle up on the couch. Mine, it's like I open it up and I'm like, oh, and I flip through it and I'm like, wait a minute, there's, there's something wrong. So the German version of Summer, they they forgot the entire first paragraph. It's It's like a monologue of Ben kind of thinking to himself, basically. That was missing. And then just a casual flip through, I'd stop and read a sentence and they'd have like the wrong character name and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. wow. That was none too pleased. And my wonderful husband sat down because he's native German and breezed through it and circled every mistake. And we sent it to the publisher and said, okay, look, you guys really got to fix this, please. Wow. That, yeah, that's yeah. bad. It's bad that he had to turn around and do their job for them. <laughs> yeah. And it's... It was a little weird, too, because they were just there was so much uh, preamble. It's like they had all these big business meetings about which book they might publish. And we really had to give them a big sales pitch. And a committee had to agree to translate Summer. And then after all of that, they their excuse for the mistakes is they rushed it so it would be out during summer. Mm. So it, marketing wise, the title would match with the current season, which is <laughs> okay. <laughs> ridiculous, frankly. I love being self-published for that reason because I just have full control. Right. Be <laughs> anal yeah. about it all. <laughs> so, you've also become a movie this summer. I, yeah. I guess it started in the spring, technically. That somewhere like summer, something like summer finally started to roll out as a film. Yeah, it's hitting well, film. How, how did that come about, and, and what's it been like to watch this this morph of your story in yet another new way? Oh, there's so many emotions. Mostly it's it's just been a dream come true. Uh, the way it started actually was one of my readers contacted me, and it was just kind of a typical, um, I read your book and I, I related to it a lot. Uh, is there going to be a movie? And I said, well, there's there's no, in, no interest as far as I know. And then he wrote back and he was very, very serious, like the tone changed completely. And he told me his story about how in college he almost produced a movie, but then he decided he didn't believe in it, and he backed off. And he felt like something like Summer would be enough for him to like finally make a movie. And that was awesome, but this is a grade school teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. you know, a Hollywood producer that's like, look kid, we're gonna make you famous. Um, and so th that was flattering and I didn't take it too seriously at first, but he was just very persistent. And then what finally struck me is I had a hell of a time trying to find a publisher for summer. And I really, I've tried going the traditional route and nobody wanted it. Uh, one publisher kind of did a couple test rounds with readers and then gave me feedback that the book was boring and said, no, thank you. Um, and that's really what started me self-publishing. And I realized that I was treating uh, this person, Tom Lee, in the same way, where it's like, you know, he's he's saying, I'm very passionate, I can make this happen, and I was dismissive, like, where are your credentials? Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, let's do this, let's, let's see what you can do, and I mean, he hit the ground running to the point where, I think a week or two later, I was talking to directors and screenwriters, and he's just been nonstop since then. It took about five or six years to reach this point we're at now, and he did it, and I'm very grateful to him. That's amazing. So it's an, it's an ind independently published book became a true independent film. Yeah, and I'm a big believer in that too, because also like um, the Spanish version of something like Summer was similar. It was a reader wrote me. He's like, "Hey, I'm fresh out of college. I want to be a translator. It's what his degree was in. Uh, can I translate your book?" And it was similar. It was like, "Okay, you you don't really have." credentials, you know, college education is great, but you don't have a track record yet. I can't look at a review and see how you did, but you've got the passion. Uh, and that's what I really love about how everything has changed um, with the advent of the internet and publishing mm -hmm. is that the gatekeepers are gone. And if people have a dream and they feel strongly about it, nothing's standing in your way. Yeah. I think that's even more so true now with, with Kickstarter too, because if you find the yeah. people who can back the project, to right. get you going, and especially with gay content. 
Yeah, and we need it too. Yeah. Uh, what was your involvement with the film? Did you were you collaborative, or was it merely like, yes, you can, you, you know, here's the rights to the story, go do it? Or I was pretty hands off at first because uh, Summer had just come out. I think maybe another book after that, and I was just starting to write something like Winter. And I was really still finding my feet as an author and trying to get used to the daily rhythm. And uh, the whole trade was new to me. And I knew that if I stopped to try to learn how to write a screenplay or try to learn everything you need to know about the movie business, that it would have really sidelined me as an author, which would have been a mistake. So I, when we, we chose the team that we chose... Um, if we were trusting them to make the movie, I decided to trust them complicitly. And that's what I did. Um, they responded to that equally by, by also trusting me. So with different uh, versions of the script, they would send it to me, and I would read through it and kind of give notes. And sometimes they would listen, and sometimes they wouldn't. And one of the things I really had to learn is to let go and let the movie be its own thing. Because, of course, the author writes the book in a certain way, and that's the way I felt the story should go exactly. A movie has different sensibilities, so, of course, things have to change. Um, but I always had that instinct to kind of push and be like, no, 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 just, just keep it like the book exactly. Keep it like the book exactly. And they didn't. I, I'd say maybe 80% of the movie is just like the book. And then the other 20%, for the most part, is just brilliant. Like, they, they took Ben singing in the book, which is very flat and not very exciting to read about him singing, more or less. Um, and all of a sudden, on screen, it's just dynamic, and it moves the plot forward, and it adds emotion. Mm -hmm. I noticed was, that, really, just from the trailer. Yeah. Of the singing, because having read the book, I mean, you know he sings, but there, you don't right. really get a, a bigger scene with it other than when he's with Tim occasionally. Yeah. And so I'm like, wow, okay, we get to see him sing in the movie. <laughs> you know, and really sing on a stage. Yep. And it's very clever. It's not, I know some people hear musical and they're like, they cringe and they're like, oh God, oh God. But it's not like that where the school cafeteria, everyone jumps up and starts dancing while Ben, Dan, you know, gets on the table and sings about his heartbreak. So it's not it's, high school musical. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing like that. The way that the songs are interwoven into the plots. It's really very clever. It's impressive. That's very cool. Yeah. What have you heard from audiences about it so far? Uh, it's been really positive, and I try to be realistic. I'm a very optimistic guy, and it's kind of like, I think of it as the restaurant phenomenon. When you eat at a restaurant and it's a really crappy meal, it's very rare that people draw attention to it. Usually if they don't like it, they go away and they never come back. Um, so I've seen it at a festival in uh, Philadelphia and was able to talk to people afterwards and it, there were readers there and there are people that had no exposure to the story already and both were very positive. Um, and that's a, a very good, good sign, but I just, you know, it could be that some people dislike it. There's people that dislike Harry Potter, like the Harry Potter books. I don't yeah. know how, but... I, I kind of think of that as a comforting thought when you, you see like the negative review that brings you down. People are going to hate everything. There's everything out there. Someone dislikes it. But the general, all the like, <laughs> all the, um, all that aside, it, it seems very hopeful. Yeah. And how do you it's as the tough, author? Though, that the book is always better thing, you know? <laughs> sometimes it's true. And sometimes, I mean, you mentioned that there's like this 20% that it's like they jumped up from the book. Yeah. And sometimes you can get that. If a movie gets in the hands of the right person, it could be different than the book and elevate the material in a different way. There's going to be people that think the movie's better than the book. That's going to be wild. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think of the movie uh, when they turned the stage musical Chicago into the movie that you know won the yeah. Oscars. It's a very different experience than you get in the stage show, but it it elevated and changed the material. Yeah. And I think why not, too? It's I mean, if you want to read the book, go read the book. And if you don't like to read, there's the audio book. So, I mean, that will always be there. That's untouchable. And the movie is its own thing. 
And in that same way, it's like you can accept it or dismiss it or love it more or love it less, but I, I'm just happy it's out there. I think it's neat. Yeah. Are you, a, a, is your author self satisfied with how it turned out? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you're always supposed to be like just completely positive in these things and be like, it's perfect. But yeah, of course there's parts where I'm like, um, I know there's one or two parts where I'm like, I know the book is better in that part. <laughs> But by that same token, there's a couple parts where it's like, I'm glad they didn't adapt that part of the book because it was kind of cheesy. <laughs> and they did something else instead, and that's fun. So, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied, definitely. What are the plans? You, you've spent the summer on the festival circuit, or at yeah. least the, the earlier summer, because we're, we're this is coming out in August. What are the plans to get it out to the people who, who don't make it to the festival? Well, what's, what's going on with the festivals is... Uh, it's kind of like you're shopping it around to distributors and distributors go to these festivals they find movies that they think are great and they're the ones that uh, decide if it's going to have a wider cinematic release um, if it's going to go on blu-ray or netflix and they work out all of those deals and all of that really needs to happen before it goes uh widespread of course so yeah it's it's tough for people to wait it's been for some of my readers, it's a very, very long wait, um, but it's finally out, and that's a, a tremendous relief. Like, it's real. It exists. People are seeing it, which is great. Very cool. Well, we'll, we'll keep people pointed to your website to find out, because I'm sure you'll put up there as soon as it's available for the world to go somewhere, oh, yeah. or to stream, Absolutely. or to whatever. <laughs> now, Summer, beyond being a movie, and an audiobook, and a book... Is also a web comic. That's right. Rather recently, and you and from what it says on the because I've only read a few of the pages since I'm trying to actually continue reading on the books, it says that there's twists from the book in the yeah. web comic. How did all this yeah. come about? Is this another fan that reached out to start doing things? Or? Yes, it is. It's a running theme. Yeah, my passionate readers, I love them. Um, and what happened was uh, I was checking my spam folder which I'd neglected for months and to my dismay there was a bunch of reader mail uh, and I was going through it and one was just real casual um, from a person named Cassie Fallon and she just said you know I loved summer and uh, like and subscribe but she'd read also here's some fan art and what she did um, she sent me beautiful illustrations and I had I've been a comic book reader for most of my life, too, and it's a beautiful medium to experience as a reader, and I really want to try my hand as a writer. Uh, sadly, I have no artistic talent, and my husband, who does the book covers, uh, has a very busy career, so he wouldn't have time to uh, to create a comic. It's a very involved process. Um, so I'd kind of been looking around for an artist and just couldn't find one that I felt matched the style of the series. Um, and when I saw this art... Like my heart leapt, and I cyber stalked her and found her DeviantArt art page, and she's a comic fan too. So she had done you know some kind of comics of her own, and it was just perfect. So I wrote her back right away, and I'm like, you know, I've always wanted this to be a comic, and she's like, wouldn't that be cool? And I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's we're chugging along. We put out a new page every week for free on GayWebComics.com. And we should tell people who might be listening on audio that you've shown a couple of, of art pieces now on the video feed. Yeah. So you got to check that video feed out and also visit the comic website if you feel uh, motivated to do so. Um, yeah, and it's just, I'm a big believer in this story, uh, the love story between Ben and Tim. And it's important to me that it reaches a wide as an audience as possible, which is why I started with the audiobooks. Uh, I got lucky with the movie, frankly, um, and then the comic book is is the next stage of this, where I'm hoping it'll it'll find new readers. And yeah, I decided to put a fresh fresh twist on it, so it doesn't start in the '90s like the books do. Um, it starts in 2015 because I think younger people will be able to relate to that a little bit more. And I also wanted to challenge myself um, to play with the story a little bit and to keep it fresh for people that have already seen the movie and read the books and everything. So they still have incentive to check it out. How's the collaboration on this work? Since you're generating fresh material, 
are you coming at it from these are the word these are the frames that we're going to put into this page or these stories and kind of framing out that way are you giving your artist here's the story now put this into art or is it kind of a mix in there somewhere it's a little bit like a tv or a stage script if you see that um we do it page by page so uh, it breaks it down into like six panels usually or whatever's necessary and i describe kind of what i imagine and then i write the dialogue uh, what i've discovered is the less pointers that i give her um the better she does even if i give her a ton of instructions of like make it look like this uh, she always exceeds my imagination, which is kind of <laughs> that's awesome. Frustrating. It's like, come on, I'm supposed to be the the author, and you're like out creating me. But I love it. <laughs> Best case scenario. <laughs> now, you're a creator that really seems to embrace the concept of Patreon. Right. Um, certainly, you talk about it a lot on the comic page as being a way to support the page to keep going. And I think I've seen even recently where you're talking about it as a way to get the funding together to keep the audiobook series right. going. Because those are certainly not cheap by any stretch of the it's, imagination. It's, yeah. Why is Patreon such an important part of the projects these days? Uh, I think what happened with YouTube this year with the Adpocalypse, where a simple change in policy resulted in a multitude of creators losing 80% of their income is a strong sign of what is very likely to happen in the future. Um, we saw something similar happen when Amazon bought Audible, who produces and puts out most audiobooks these days. Uh, they slash the royalties that authors earn. And it's very hard when dealing with these giants as the little guy um, to make your voice heard because you're reliant on them for money. So the choice is kind of between sucking it up and, and taking it or um, withdrawing your material and losing whatever income remain, remains. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the gay, any kind of gay media has a very limited appeal at this point. I know there's lots of straight women that have added to the readership and, and made it a little bit more lucrative, but it's still very niche. And uh, that makes it a struggle for most people to focus on their art. And most authors in this genre have day jobs and they have to squeeze their writing in wherever they can. And that's unfortunate because uh, stories need a lot of attention um, to be the best they can be. But at the same time, we all have practical concerns. We have bills to pay, we need to eat. So uh, yeah, with Patreon, once again, it's the passion of the readers that believe in the story and they're willing to you know, contribute a couple dollars each month to make sure they keep going. But the nice thing is it's not a handout and you're able to create um, specialized material. It's allowed me to experiment. Um, I've done stories just with texting. Where I take my husband's phone and my phone and I, I write you know, a conversation back and forth and I say it's Ben and Tim talking and I can throw in photos and stuff like that. It's the kind of thing that I wouldn't have been able to publish even as an ebook, um, but on Patreon it works. So that's that's a nice aspect of it too. It's empowered me to be creative in, in ways that wouldn't have been practical otherwise. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I'm loving it. Yeah, we've seen at least in in the true MM romance space that that I write in most often. Yeah. I've, We've seen some backlash on some people who do Patreon because uh -huh. it's like, well, I already pay for your books. Why do I need to do that? And I think you quite eloquently put it, you know, especially for the self-pub people. Yeah. And frankly, even for those who deal with publishers, because it is such a small niche that it, it allows the creativity to happen in different ways or more often than it might otherwise. Yeah. And it's... I think it's important to be realistic too, because a lot of people, you'll get reader mail and they're like, you know, I'm sure your assistant is reading this or I'm sure you get a million of these every day. And it's like, man, I wish. I mean, I'm very much a one man operation. Mm -hmm. um, and when I do get help from the outside, like editors, um, even my husband's covers, we don't do this anymore, but for years and years I paid him for every single one. 
Uh, the only reason we stopped is because it would just go back into our personal bank account. Right. So, so, <laughs> uh, but like I, likewise with the comics, like I would never expect someone to to work on those comics or the Spanish translation or any of the other things I talked about for free just because they like the story. It's very important for me that people are fairly compensated. Yeah, you definitely never want to ask a fellow creator to do something for free yeah. unless there's a reason to get a sample first. Right. And I've been offered that too with some people. Um, and I've been offered prices that I felt were lower than what was fair and said, no, like how about this amount instead? And I mean, that's important for people to know. It's like, you're not giving money just so I can go out and eat lobster every day. You're giving money not only to keep me going as an artist and to further what I can actually do, but this is, this is like the wealth, wealth is spreading the wealth. You know, what money there is, is spreading to other people and, and helping to allow them to be creative too, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess we, we get to kind of the point, the, the part of the, of your story that it's going to, some people are going to go, oh, although most already probably know this, that something, the something like series is coming to a close. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's coming in the finale and, and when is, when is it coming? <laughs> well, there's two books out unless something like hail has come out by the time this is aired which is quite possible um and something like hail was cool that's going back to patreon where that was a writing experiment where i wrote a little bit and then i would pull the reader the patreon supporters and say okay there's three things that could happen what do you choose and without fail they always chose the thing i didn't want them to <laughs> but that kept me on my toes creatively and i think it benefited the book you know it's a little bit more original than it might have been otherwise if left to my own devices um, so that was kind of an unexpected entry into the series. I thought it would be a short story. It turned into a full length novel cause we were having so much fun together. Yeah. Then after that, uh, is something like forever. And for that one, we returned to Ben and Tim's perspective. It's the first something like book where it shares perspective. So it goes back and forth. The others are like very solidly one person's perspective. And, um, it's very much their future. It's, it doesn't retrace events at all, really. It just takes us as far as we can possibly go with them. And it's heartbreaking, frankly. It was oh. very hard to say goodbye to these guys because they feel real to me and I love them dearly. What's yeah. on your drawing board after, after that? Because you did have several books out that were not in the Something Like series back in like 2012. And then it's, it's yeah. been like something like for years now right what do you see next after this closes out i would love because you do get series fatigue and luckily with this i only felt it with one book in the, the entire series where i was kind of dragging my feet a little bit um but a lot of retelling events from other characters perspectives is kind of fighting against yourself you paint yourself in a corner like you want something to happen but then you double check a previous book and you realize that you can't do that because you said this or even an off comic could could restrict what you write so i'm very much looking forward to writing something that's not part of a series where i can just let my hair down and let my imagination run wild um, i'd eventually like to write the third and final book in the local legend series which has a tiny following <laughs> but um as a fantasy reader uh, that followed multiple series that never concluded. Uh, and just because I, I like those stories too, I'd like to, to round that off with a third book. Um, mostly I just want to experiment again, like I was at the beginning and see where that takes me. Well, when you stop. figure that out, we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back when those come out and, and start to see where you've, you've taken yourself. Yeah. We'll see if I, like a lot of aging rock stars, I'll be like, uh, something like book 12's coming out. Surprise. <laughs> the reunion tour. <laughs> right. Uh, by popular demand. I'm hoping so, to avoid it. <laughs> What's the best way for fans to keep up with your work? Um, you can go to jbellbooks.com, and there's links there to everything, like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and um, the webcomic and Patreon. If you want to skip to the comic, it's once again gaywebcomics.com. If you're curious about the movie, you can go to something like summer.com. I don't run that site, but the movie people do. And you can see the trailer and learn about the actors and 
where it's going to be screening near you. Cool. Yeah, we'll put, put all those goodies in the show notes. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, Jay, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a blast talking to you. Yeah, I've had fun.